destabilizes, depixelizes. Welcome everyone into Garden of Doom. This is a very special swap cast because it's not just Garden of Doom. We're doing a show with David Gitson, and he is the host of Living Process, which is a YouTube show on architecture, but he's here and it's a swap cast, which means he's also the, the host just as much as I am. So David, please tell everyone about yourself. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. So my name is David Getson, and I, I work with my team in building design, mostly houses, built a design and permitting in Pasadena, California, and regionally, remotely across the country for uh, getting good stuff done that ways, and uh, sharing all kinds of random, weird, fun thoughts on architecture, history, and other things on my YouTube channel, Living Process, my Twitter. You can follow me at HistofArch, at H-I-S-T-O-F-A-R-C-H. And I was very um, pleasantly happy to hear about Jeff's uh, podcast, and um, we're going to be uh, talk talking about some uh, debunking, I believe. Yeah, it's, it seems so. So this this came about, dear audience, the listeners of Garden of Doom, if you've been a long-term listener, you remember that uh, Chris Anderson, uh, that's not exactly how to pronounce his name properly, but that's how he told me to introduce him to the mostly American audience um, from the Eastern Border podcast was on, oh, probably a year and a half, two years ago already. And we talked about some Eastern European mythology, myths, legends, and, and things like that. We were going to do a second show where we were going to do the Anunnaki in Russia, but right as we were scheduling it, a little nasty thing called the ramp up to what became the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, was going on. And so we decided to put that on hold. And of course, that war is still going 15 months later. Anyway, I heard David on Chris's podcast when he was taking a break from just war coverage and, and talking about some other stuff, architecture and things like that. And David mentioned some of his hobbies and things that he was interested in. And I'm like, you know what? That gives me an idea. I've had people here on about Tartaria. I've had Cliff Dunning on from Earth Ancients. Love Cliff, love the show. He was on episode 50, I believe. Um, and spoken to a lot of people who have said things that I have no way of fact checking them. Um, and what I heard was, you know, the, the, the ancients have th this amazing technology that was either a result of lost technology from an ancient human civilization or, you know, ancient aliens. Aliens help people build Stonehenge, the pyramids, Angkor Wat. Um, and more recently, there's Tartaria. And anyone who listened two months ago to Andrew Goff, and I love Andrew, on Tartaria, you've heard this rather new, at least new to me, uh, and he acknowledged it was sort of new to him as well, theory that there was a mud flood somewhere around 1900 and the proof is in the photos that there's no people and that buildings were built, uh, you know, underground and you see half exposed windows and, and, and things like that. And I'm like, huh, if I have a if I only knew an architect who was interested in those types of things, I could ask. I've done the same thing with Mars and the moon with with scientists, um, you know, and I've also invited a flat earther on. They've been avoiding me. And then I'd have scientists give, you know, their case and the other case. So David was kind enough to say yes to this notion. We arranged this in like four days uh, just through emails and things don't normally happen that quickly. So I'm so thankful to David for that. But that's basically what the show is going to be about. But I think that maybe I've been doing a lot of talking here. And, you know, David, you can just give a little bit more about your background if you like and, you know, where you went to school or, or you know, whatever you want to say to sure. my listeners. I'm sure your listeners already know. Okay, fantastic. Well, hopefully both of us have tons of new listeners. And uh, by the way, and thanks, and especially a uh, great thanks to uh, Christoph at um, the Eastern Border. Yeah, he covers an incredible uh, great range and array of things. I originally came to him when he was, uh, before, before the war, he, he had excellent history coverage on, um, yeah. on the interaction between uh, East and West and Eastern Europe. So my, uh, like I said, my company, uh, Living Process LLC with uh, Greg and Fred over here, livingprocess.net. If anybody is curious, if you want to see the 
<clears throat> excuse me, if you want to see the actual projects and stuff we've done recently and anyone who's curious and wants to talk about building design stuff with me, we're building designers, uh, that would be fantastic. And the uh, where I went to school, I went to uh, the Harvard GSD, got my master's there um, in uh, graduated 2011, and I've been traveling far too much. I've uh, my location now. I like being here and want to <laughs> continue helping people out in this community for for uh, decades if I could. So uh, that's that's what I do. I've been uh, I, I love ancient history. I also love the esoterica and exotica that has been floating. I get good words for it. Maybe that's been floating around the Internet, YouTube and Twitter. And when was it? How long ago was it that you the mud flood stuff has been around in Tartaria also when uh, when was it that it first crossed your radar? I first heard of Tartaria uh, Concrete probably about a year ago. A uh, former guest of this show, PJ Black, some people might know him from the professional wrestling world. He's a He was a professional wrestler. He was in WWE for five years under the name Justin Gabriel, and he introduced me to Tartaria, um, but he didn't know much about it. He wanted us to look into it, um, so I did, um, And but it's really new I've, I've actually contacted a couple of twitter accounts about it and and it's funny that the ones that have certified accounts on tartaria either they're like i'm not comfortable talking about it or i'll try to get you someone and then they disappear which is sort of like the flat earthers yeah. and that's always you know pretty close to a red flag for me um there's not much here but it's interesting and I think maybe for the benefit of your audience and maybe even mine maybe i should introduce myself because the strange thing about this show is I really I, I don't reveal very much about myself on the show. I think people have picked it up over time as things have been let loose. But my name is Jeff Lippman. I grew up in New York. I went to Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we called that the Harvard of the South. So that's why I had to get that in. I went to law school at the University of Maryland um, in Baltimore. That's where the professional campuses are. Um, and I've been a practicing lawyer now for 30 years. Uh, but I'm also a geek kid. I like Dungeons and Dragons. I like the Jason and the Argonauts movies. I Thor was my favorite superhero, maybe still is. Um, and I remembered Land of the Lost as being something much deeper than it actually turned out to be. Uh, and I never really satisfactorily got past page six of the Bible because I was looking at plot holes and wondering what's this all about. And so this show has been my lazy way of researching everything I'm curious about without actually lifting a finger myself other than hitting record. So I'm sort of like a lazy intellectual um, and the journey has been amazing. And and I'm not sure if you were my first guest from Harvard, but but you know the first I remember right now. So that's cool. I have an I have a Harvard person on there. So awesome. This is this is cool. This is cool, too. Um, but yeah, we, we this is you know, I'm sure it's going to be mostly about debunking. You know, I, I I hear it all the time. We've lost the technology. We could not build what the Aztecs and the Maya and the, and the Olmecs built. We could not build what the Egyptians built. I'm like, is that really true? I'm pretty sure we probably could. Yeah. The, the, quest, the, the, the whole thing is that the answer to that, as is usually true with history, is the answer is yes and no. <laughs> at the same time, right? And then the question is, well, that's not enough. You got to, okay, how yes and how no and what and how and why and et, et cetera. Um, a little bit without getting too lost. I want to get into the real meat and potatoes of it, but come, it's kind of the fun, kooky, crazy stuff. We can't ignore that. I first heard about Tartaria when this is going to sound made up, but it's not. It's one of those one of those things. I, it, it was probably 2013, around about the same time I was discovering a... Uh, uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. He was releasing yeah. um, the amazing podcast of uh, Death Throes of the Republic, which I've listened to like five or six times all the way through. And it, it inspired me to do my own podcast, which is still kicking it up and around. Um, but my my YouTube stuff is my newest stuff. Um, a History of Architecture is what the podcast is called. If anyone wants that background on me, I was I had trouble falling asleep in 2013 probably when I was living in New Jersey working in Brooklyn and one of the there were like back then before they called it ASMR they were like whisper channels and the YouTube algorithm gave me a video on that 
that was not intentionally that, but people had been appreciating what they call unintentional ASMR. And there was this this Bulgar this Bulgarian woman with a podcast channel. I think you can still find it called New Earth. And she had this one could get one could speculate on all kinds of conspiracy theories about who was supporting her to do this and what and why. But maybe maybe that's more fun to speculate than talk about. But she would go on and on about and she would she would talk about she had these very these very precise kind of accent and would talk about the survivor empire in the the, the so-called Roman Empire was actually no evidence for this, but her survivors of great Tartaria were able to, and she'd go on and on about this. And so it was very speculative and very up in the air. Uh, and I looked at it and then, you know, there there's that, and tar the idea of Tartaria to define it is that pretty much the debunk of that is that uh, in, the 16-ish, 17-ish hundreds, there were old maps, and instead of saying uh, Mongol whatever, or uh, I guess what were they called, the Golden Horde, or the Empire Tons. of Timur the Lame, they would write, that to make it really simple, because the Western European guys weren't all that interested, and they didn't know that much, they just had a big kind of shaded area on the map, and they wrote Tartaria, because that's what the... That's what you called guys on horsebacks, like it's in Shakespeare plays, guys on horsebacks with really strong bows, you called Tatars. And there's even Tatars in Crimea and all that. So, uh, but then for some reason, a kind of Russian nationalist sentiment seized upon this and it fused and it mutated with the whole Carolingian missing time theory, which is another weird flat earth style thing. Uh, and then it got, for, I don't know how it got associated with mud flood. Maybe we can blame new earth lady for this by mentioning it in the same episode, which she might've done, uh, but the mud flood stuff, I lived in Chicago and miss it dearly. And I lived in Chicago for many years. And so I knew what was actually going on with a lot of this is that these people who would uh, sometimes a little bit of learning is a dangerous thing. Sometimes a little bit of learning is an exciting or an embarrassing thing at the same time. So, but there, yeah, there are buildings. There are buildings that when they're getting renovated or even work done on the street, you have half of it covered or more. Right. Um, in Chicago specifically, and I'm sure also in many places uh, across the South, I've seen photos across the South of this, any place that like Chicago had actual mud, real mud streets, and then they laid down sewer tracks and then they laid paving above it. This covered up half the houses. And they did this on purpose so that you could get plumbing in all the houses and it was actually cheaper to do it that way in the 19th century than it was to excavate and cut and dig the way they do today. Cause you know, modern, I was gonna say steam shovels, modern excavating equipment is a real kind of miracle in some ways and it made it a lot cheaper to excavate. So that change in technology is part of why we now excavate sewage tunnels instead of laying this, this stuff on top. That has a lot to do with the mud flood thing. Um, the real, and th like th th there's, there are actual real floods that real science has been discovering and people like Randall Carlson and even Graham Hancock with his fabulism um, that sometimes goes too far, but like a certain percentage of the time, Graham Hancock is actually on about correct and fascinating stuff. Sure. And he's a good enough guy to admit when he's been debunked, when he thinks he has been, and his stuff has changed over time, but it's pointed to stuff that we now know more about how the ice age ended, that it's way cooler. Like I remember being a young boy in the eighties and all the books said we had absolutely no idea why the dinosaurs died. And then Chicxulub, became common knowledge and it changed. We're going through a similar transition with the ice age with all this fascinating, interesting stuff. And the really interesting thing is that there was human culture at that right. time. There were utter geniuses with, with quartz, clear quartz spearhead tools and the Clovis points and everything in North America. And you know what? Yeah, the clock did get set back 5,000 years on that civilization. People joke kind of half seriously about that if that comet hadn't hit us, the North American civilization would have been on the moon in, the in I don't know, uh, at the time the Great Pyramids were being built, if, if you think about it that way. Yeah, uh, in terms of technology that we lost, the other thing is, is that uh, we could build this stuff today. We don't want to because it's not economically 
There's no economic incentive or spiritual incentive that drives the economic incentive. There was a fantastic guy who was a great influence on me in terms of lecturing and in history, Eugen Weber. You can find his stuff on YouTube with the, the Western tradition. Eugen Weber's fantastic. And he once said, and he went through 52 episodes going through all known recorded Western history. Oh, great. And one of the things that he said about the Middle Ages is he said, it's important for us to remember that there was more stone quarried, dressed, and built in the years of Gothic France. Not just all of Fra Gothic France. This is the kind of the high Middle Ages between 1000 and 1400. In those years, those few centuries, there was more stone quarried, designed, built, put into the cathedrals by volume of stone than in all of old kingdom Egypt. Wow. That's impressive. So sure now does this... Does that mean that we have lost now also Herodotus, the whole idea about the pyramid being 12, built in 20 years? I want to debunk that because that's probably bunk. The pyramid, the Great Pyramid was probably built in phases. The whole 20 year thing is treated like gospel truth. That's actually hearsay from Herodotus. Herodotus's tour guides in Egypt said, oh, yeah, we that was probably built during the reign of Khufu. You figure out Khufu's reign is 20 years. They assume it was built in 20 years. If you look at it from an engineering perspective, it's very likely, we don't know how, it's very likely that it was built in phases, possibly spread out over centuries or longer. Um, technology that we've lost, that's real, <laughs> is uh, I've been to the Larco Museum. I worked for two-ish years in Lima, Peru, and um, the Larco Museum in Lima is I would say it's the best part of Lima. I'm not a huge Lima fan, but the Larco Museum's fantastic. And it's a, from a guy who started excavating his own garden, finding old pottery that no one cared about in like the 19 teens and the 1920s. And he made his mansion there a museum. And it has been one of the best museums in the world for ancient South American pre-Columbian stuff. One of the things, one of the things that's fun that they have there is about the chicken DNA question. Where are the chickens from? There's, right. The DNA is ambiguous. The chickens might have come from the Spanish. The chickens might have come from Southeast Asia and the Polynesians on boats, like Moana. We do, right. right? The DNA is ambiguous. The, the the art evidence. They have sculptures that look like chickens that are definitely pre-Columbian. So I think that somehow chickens came across the specific, but that's beside the point on the technology. On the technology, we know that the Mayans had concrete that was better than the Romans, that we still have not reverse engineered the chemistry of. Uh, the Inca had gold plate. It's something that drove the Spanish crazy is that the Incas didn't make stuff out of solid gold. The Incas liked doing gold plate because you get more of it. it they weren't right. selling it as solid gold. They wanted it to be beautiful, ceremonial, religious stuff because it was like the sun and it was important to them. They only did gold plate. The Spanish made their money out of silver. They got, they were like kind of upset maybe that they saw so much gold, but they were, there wasn't that much there. Silver did it for them um, during the, all the Phillips. And the, we still don't know how they did it. They, they had this amazing gold plate chemistry that we still haven't figured out. There's good speculation that they also had um, some type of hydrochloric acid derivative that I wish I could remember. I looked up to I, I, in my spare time to see, is there some type of plant that if you make a, a toxic tea out of it and boil the heck out of it, that it gets acidic? Yeah, there is. There's plants that the Incans could have had that they boil and boil and boil and boil and boil. And then it turns into hydrochloric acid that's strong enough that you could fizzle out limestone. Guess what? That stuff that looks like it's kind of melty on the outside with those bricks, that stuff that's yep. limestone like that, if they put that paste on there and use leather gloves so you don't burn your hands and get a chemical burn, you put that on there and you swing and rub the rocks together and it kind of fizzles out the edges and the limestone dissolves. That's quite possibly how they did uh, whatever you call it, uh, Ben from Uncharted X with his Hanan Pacha and the, the ramparts in Cuzco. So it's kind of fun but also kind of frustrating that there's all this speculation about saying, oh, we could never do it. The, the attitude of we could never do it is kind of an insult to both us and them, like they were somehow magic people and we're stupid, which is insulting right. both ways, I guess. But the um, th there's really fascinating stuff that's totally possible, but a lot of what gets talked about is just kind of silly silliness. Okay. Well, there's a lot there. 
I had um, Andy from the History of Africa on a, a few times. Uh, and one of the first shows he did, he talked about the pyramids as well. He's like, no, people made that and and they made it by trial and error. Uh, and you can tell because there's yeah. lots of smaller pyramids and there's lots of pyramids that, that weren't completed because they fell down. Yeah. And so you can see them learning how to do it. Um, Someone who, uh, I forget his host, Chris, I think is his name also, from the History of China, uh, somebody posted, what is the, the, there's a huge compound in China, It it's not Angkor Wat, obviously, but it's it's sort of the Chinese equivalent of that. In, in any event, the, the, the name doesn't matter, I wish I could remember it, but somebody said, it's impossible for anyone to, uh, to have built, any humans to have built it. It was a miracle. And he's like, well, it did take them 600 years. <laughs> so well, maybe it was the Great Wall of China. I don't know. But whatever it was, you know, people were acting like it, they built it. Sort of like you were saying about Khufu, 20 years, this this myth that it took 20 years. And he's like, no, it took 600 years to do it. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, so there's, you know, our, our measurement of time is different in, you know, our, our level of patience. And anyone who doesn't, you know, eat. If even if you're 40 years old or or younger and you've seen movies from the 1980s, if you try and watch E.T. or Terminator right now, you're going to go crazy with boredom because it takes forever to start based on movies today that everything starts right away. It goes straight into Fast and Furious mode. Just imagine, you know, uh, eras with without any sort of built in entertainment, you know, at at fingertips. The level of patience is different. If a if a voyage took three months on a steamship, or it took three weeks on a steamship versus three months on on a, a Cuddy Sark or whatever, or a Man of War, that was considered an an immense uh, achievement. And in fact, it was. Now, for us, if the flight takes more than four hours, we're pissed off. <laughs> um, so you know, we 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 value time differently because of technology. But I think that plays into it a lot. And People try to, you know, shoehorn or, or retrofit whatever time stamps they want. And it's almost impossible to do, de, uh, disprove these things because my understanding is that carbon dating has some serious limitations and something has Several. to be. Yeah. And you have to be like underground and be able to see certain hallmarks of the leveling, like measuring ground isn't always exactly the way to do it. You have to you, there needs to be certain levels. Like I, I like I know in Rome, there's levels where there's like a quarter inch or half inch of, of ash. And they know that that was from Pompeii or something like that. So you, there are hallmarks uh, until you get into like different layers of geology. It's absolutely it's one. It's fascinating. In, in Italy, I was uh, I was honored enough to uh, spend some time uh, working there. I was I was in Sorrento uh, working with the. Um, uh, Museo Museo di Intarsia di Legno with uh, Alessandro Fiorentino, the architect there, in the Museum of Wood Inlay, and there are cafes. There's a there's a trattoria in Piano di Sorrento where you can go, and they will have uh, places that are. It's really hard to build places sometimes in some of those cities that aren't straight into a hill because they got the cliffside on the ocean. The hills go up, and then the hills are made out of volcanic tuff out of the stone that's hardened from the several eruptions. And you can see, you can actually see the layers when you go to the back of the restaurant or if you sit in the basement and walk down the stairs, you'll see the stratigraphy there. And it, and it does, it does, I was always curious, well, was one of those layers from Pompeii? Well, that's possible, but that's just part of daily life there and carbon dating. And you can see like chunks of petrified wood in there or wood that's not yet petrified. Um, yeah, carbon dating is fantastic. The what is it? The decay of radiocarbon fourteen, the half life of it. Uh, so it was a miracle when that thing was uh, when that was discovered, uh, and we can date things like bones and especially teeth um, that preserves the carbon. But uh, after a while, it completely decays in its half life to where the signal is not discernible. I forget how many thousands of years it is, but it gets less accurate as you go back. Also, it's not a perfectly steady decay. Um, and the research about the Ice Age has thrown light on this because roundabout at certain points, the amount, as far as they can tell, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere went absolutely haywire bonkers. 
Um, I think the reasonable speculation for that is because of asteroid impact or comet impact. We're introducing new carbon-14 into the atmosphere, which then settles and goes into the plants, it goes into the plant eaters, it goes into the meat eaters, et cetera. And that's why the more sophisticated stuff, maybe they started doing this in the 70s with, with the dendro, the den, I gotta practice, dendrochronological um, calibration, is that if they, they, they looked at tree ring data and, and chronology from tree ring data from unknown uh, a known tree and a known piece of wood, and uh, because you can see from the thickness of the rings, the pattern of the years from the precipitation, they used that to calibrate it, and they found this came into play with the controversial dating of a place which I think is not Atlantis with uh, what do you call it, Santorini? Mm -hmm. Because and that's and it doesn't have that's that's a good point that I'm remembering here. It doesn't have to, to you don't have to have an, an asteroid impact to screw up your carbon fourteen. You right. can have a volcano. Mm -hmm. So, so that that's why dendrochronology and all these specializations are so important that they talk to each other, uh, and that's uh, you know, for example, in, in anyone who's curious about if there was an exodus, how many exoduses, and when did they happen, uh, the explosion of Santorini, and when did that happen, and we're still not sure. Uh, that's that's all part of part of answering those puzzles. Yeah, we've had uh, Ralph Ellis on the show, and and we did a, his his topic was so large, we gave him two episodes yeah. back to back. Did one He's fascinating, but I did one right before New Year's and one right after New Year's to you know to give you some doom in the beginning and give you some doom at the end, or vice versa rather. But you know, he thinks Atlantis was Santorini. I I personally don't, uh, and that's not even important. But he he definitely ties in the eruption to one of the exoduses, and he believes that there yeah. were two. Meanwhile, there's really no ar archeological or anthropological or there's no evidence of any sort of an exodus of, uh, uh, of people of 100,000, 100, a nation of 100,000 or more being in the Sinai for any amount of time, let alone 40 years. There's not that. There is not that. I have some sympathy. I have some sympathy with Ralph Ellis's hypotheses. I think he's one of those guys where he's so outrageous. Ralph Ellis loves, I'm going to say this, and, and Ralph, I love you if you're listening. I hope you're listening. But so Ralph, Ralph Ellis, some, sometimes some, like Ralph Ellis and Graham Hancock, I put in the same category that if, that, that when, that when there's a weakness to their arguments, it's because they love awesome too much. And they will they'll, they'll they'll research the awesome, and sometimes their awesome has a lot of substance behind it, and sometimes the awesome is on a little bit of thin ice. Uh, his his Santorini Atlantis, I would disagree with. Uh, I think his perspective on the on the Exodus seas, he, he argues, is pretty interesting. Uh, you're right. You're right with the um, the no evidence of quite a lot of people in the desert. Ralph Ellis would counter that to say. It wasn't necessarily a lot of people in the desert, um, and it. What, however, he he goes into the details of that without getting into a huge Ralph Ellis thread, which is totally possible. But there's, um, in terms of linguistic evidence, Ralph Ellis does fascinating work looking at the kings lists and finding homologies, yes. which I, if people want to listen to your stuff, Ralph Ellis probably went over that. But with with the with the Davidic line and the idea that okay, the Southern Kingdom was, and this is the thing that gets people like Zahi Hawass very paranoid when they do crazy things like call, uh, what's his name, Robert Bouval. He calls a Belgian guy of mixed Romanian, I forget Robert Bouval's complex ancestry, but he calls Robert Bouval a Zionist because he's nervous. Well, he shouldn't be nervous. I don't think there's anything to be nervous about, but maybe I can understand why he's nervous when Ralph Ellis talks about, yeah, the kingdom of the Southern Kingdom of Judea yeah, that was also, um, what do you call it, dynasty, colony. The minimalists would say that, oh, Judea was only a, Judea at that time was a colony of Egypt. Ralph Ellis would say, uh, yeah, it was. And the people who later said that they were kings of Jerusalem counted their line back to what used to be a capital in Avaris or Tanis or whatever. So I think that's that's fascinating. And then there's a little bit, I may as well share this because because when else can I talk about this with anybody who cares? I, I've, 
I have annoyed rabbis with my interest in history. I have to find ones that are that, that have time. But there, there, there's a bit in, in Psalms, uh, there, there's a bit in Psalmic prayers that get read very, very regularly often. And being aware of some of this history, having that cross cross my eye, it's, you know, there's, uh, I forget exactly what and where it is, but it, it talks about, you know, the, uh, the, the great Lord, King of the universe, uh, who, who uh, from Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. And I thought that's, that's a very remarkable phraseology from Zion who dwells right. in Jerusalem. It might be, it might be that they're saying, well, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, God, God comes from Zion and dwells in Jerusalem. That could make sense, but it still seems weird. What makes it seem less weird to me is if the Zion that they're talking, that they're meaning there, that they're, that that's a pun that, that Roth Ellis talks about this Zion and Zoan, this might be, a recovery of an Egyptian thing, and uh, but I know I think this is very fascinating, and this gets into a whole other topic. But they you know there there's stuff like the the, the seal. It's either Josiah or Hezekiah. I get them mixed up like Keats and Shelley. But there's uh, the 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 great seal of one of them has uh, it it has an Aten disc on it. And then you think about what Roth Ellis says about Adonai. There are these, and it's been well attested that there are linguistic influences from the north and from the south. On, right. on the ancient scriptures, uh, but there's, however the Exodus happened, if it happened, I think it's undeniable. East. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and there, it's it's undeniable that there is this Egyptian uh, connection. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Egypt was the one of the largest players back there, along with you know Babylon, Babylon, and and of course yeah. Rome. And people forget about the Aksumites, who were you know, were big players in their time as well, and some of that overlapped. But yeah, I, Ralph is definitely very large on phonetics, phonetic similarities as being proof. It's interesting, and he can back up a lot of things, and he can and he can weave very interesting stories uh, and tales. I, you know, I'm just not ready to say that they're all history. I'm not ready to say that they're all wrong either. I had another guest on who explained that. Uh, in when in the times when people were writing the Bible and all the revisions and basically the what would probably ended up being 700 years before they started writing the Old Testament and finished up with the New Testament, um, that 40 basically just meant a long time. So 40 days in the mm -hmm. desert for Jesus wasn't really 40 days. It was a long time. For, 40 years in in the in the Sinai desert it wasn't really 40 years it's just like it was a really long time that they that they were there um and you know i think according to ralph they they probably weren't there nearly that long they they crossed into and they they you know got into jericho and it, and there's a little bit of a plot hole there too because if you believe the story of og of bashan Moses killed Og of Bashan, but Og of Bashan was in Canaan, which is, you know, which was basically everything from northern Syria down to where Israel meets the Sinai. Um, and so Moses, who never crossed into the land of Israel, right. somehow led a large war where they killed 100,000 uh, Canaanites in Jericho and Og of Bashan. So Moses had to get into the Holy Land of uh, See, those are these are one of those plot holes that yeah. led me led me to, on this this journey. But obviously, we could talk forever and about all of these things. But I want to try to stick to the debunking of the architecture and absolutely this whole thing of Tatari. I mean, really, just took me by surprise because it seemed like it was basically some you know like an Asian version of Atlantis, but it was so much bigger, and people were saying so much about technology, almost like it was Wakanda. Uh, you know, you know, out there now we've got the steps and winter and all that. And yes, it's probably a hard place to excavate, but it probably also there'd be signs of that. And I know that there's a tribe called the Tatars or that somebody or maybe it was an axonym that other people called them the Tatars. I, I don't know which I don't know which is the chicken or the egg. Um, but when I was young, that's one of the tribes I learned, the Magyars, the Tatars, the Mongols, you know, and then you learn about the Pashiniks and the Parthians and the Chaldeans and the various Turkish peoples and Iranic peoples and the Scythians and all that. And it's all never ending fun. And probably none of it was fun in real life. Yes, there were probably swarms of different 
horsemen, you know, uh, raining down on you with arrows. And they were probably being chased by different swarms of horsemen raining down on them with arrows. Uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't think, I don't want to get into the question of indigeny because it's 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 a never ending thing. I you know I I just say that I don't think anybody chose to live above the Arctic Circle. You know, at some point eight thousand years ago, mm. they figured hyperborea. Yeah. Well, this we is well, this is. This is my theory about Hyperborea. I think that it, it's quite possible that Hyperborea is a memory not of the Arctic Circle, but a memory of the receding Alpine and Carpathian glaciers. Mm. And that north of those, there was a developed culture of redheaded Celtic people. Um, that might be the, the productive angle there. Yeah, no, it could be. I mean, I've heard people say Ultima Tool was Ireland. I've heard them say it was Iceland. More <laughs> likely, it's just it was just a placeholder, like Atlantis. Not necessarily a place, not necessarily not a place, uh, but you know, just just an archetype of of a of a memory of a culture of of people who at some point were scarier than the people that you were, whoever you were familiar with, um, you know, and then. All legends grow larger. That's sort of almost the definition of legend. Um, so yeah, but Hyperborea is another one that can't put my finger on. I had a couple shows on Atlantis, and uh, I know that there was some in one legend. The Atlanteans came from Hyperborea. In a, in another legend, they lost a war to a power to the east before losing a war. That, that's the thing about Atlantis. Everyone's like the Atlanteans. They knew this, that, and the other thing. Well. Even if you take the story of Atlantis to be exactly 100% true, all we know about them is that they seem to be great at everything else but stunk at warfare because they lost to a power to the east and then they lost to the Athenians who they taught everything to. So, I mean, it's and it seems like it was a much different techno technological uh, gap than, say, the British uh, losing to the, the 13 colonies. It might be. I mean, Atlantis, boy, we could, we could dwell on uh, Atlantis is like a... Like 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 Russian like Russian dolls with hyperlinks of debunking. It's uh, there's a lot to go through. Um, my own I can be upfront about my own belief and speculation on Atlantis is that I tend I tend to favor the Azores hypothesis. One thing that's very compelling about that that there was something out there is that they have tilty pyramids. Mm -hmm. They have step back tilted pyramids and. Um, you know, for people who have cleared a fee, and they, the, 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 the typical conventional hypothesis is that, well, those were Portuguese farmers who were clearing their fields. Hmm. I, I doubt that farmers or people who have done farm work came up with that hypothesis. If you're clearing fields of field stone, and those stones are roughly the right size that you have to do that, and you throw them out in front of you and make piles, um, that would be a pretty unique culture that would not only stack their f cleared field stones, not into walls like most normal people, but they would put it into a pyramid and then they would tilt the pyramid somehow to make a point or to keep the rain off. I don't know. What seems more likely to me is that there back when uh, there were, we know that there were seafaring people in the Bay of Biscay. There's something called the Salutrian hypothesis from Stan Dennis, Dennis Stanford, either Stanford or Stanford. Uh, he's had trouble getting his ideas out there because people strongly disagree with him. I think he's onto something. He's a guy who did a lot of uh, archaeology. He, he's put in his dues. He's done archaeology in Siberia. And then he also did a lot of archaeology in um, Delaware Bay um, in the Delmarva Peninsula, where a lot of the Clovis and pre-Clovis stuff is. Clovis is not centered where it was discovered in New Mexico. The culture, the Clovis culture is centered in the Northeast. And back then, the Gulf Stream was a little bit different. The Gulf Stream did swing out and around the Azores. Uh, it was quite possible that you would get stuck and or on purpose in your little boat, get swept out to, Azor, uh, to Azores that were a big landmass back then. Uh, and uh, the Salutrian, morphologically, by the shape of them, the Salutrian leaf points are very much are very much related to the older Clovis and slightly pre-Clovis stuff that you find in Delaware. Um, there's there's good reason, and again, we don't know, but there's very good reason to believe. And this getting speculating even more, but something I think there's something to the Haplogroup X thing. 
uh, where there's DNA that's common. And now either these people came through Siberia out of one little dot in the Altai Mountains and left no tracks across the rest of Siberia or the rest of Alaska and everything into like the Cherokee and the Algonquin and whoever has a haplogroup X. Or the people with haplogroup X among the Bosque and the Bay of Biscay came across uh, through the Azores also hunting seals on the ice sheet, got their chert and Labrador, which we know they carried from that down to around Massachusetts. That's possible. So I think that the Atlantis myth may cover Azores stuff. Uh, it's very popular to talk about the eye of the Recot structure. That's another yes. awesome research with Jimmy, uh, Jimmy uh, Bright Insight. Um, fun, great observations and work. And I think there's weird stuff that's been happening there. And maybe that influenced the myth of Atlantis. Um, but I still have yet to see evidence of anything that was ancient that was there. That's more. They, they could have been related. I mean, it, 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 could, it could be have been. false choice. I mean, the, the water levels were lower. There were there were there. Uh, there could have been a land bridge or a series of islands that are not islands now. Uh, and, you know, at, Atlantis, if it was a continent, it would have multiple cities um, yep. with different purposes and different looks. Or you could have a continent called Atlantis where they called their capital city Atlantis. I mean, in, in New York, they call it New York, New York. Now, it's not the capital. It's Albany. But there are places where, you know, the the, the name of the city yeah. and the name of the country or continent could exactly. could well be the, could well be the same. I mean, it's, Ciudad de Mexico, you know, it's uh, exactly do it. It, it. Yeah, it's 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 easy. It makes sense. Um, so I, I find that very interesting. The, the recap structure, I just I mean, the. It, it looks like someone took a giant Phillips head screwdriver into the earth and, you know, it would, it would, I would just call it a quarry if it wasn't something like 25 miles in diameter or 25 kilometers in, in diameter. And, you know, so I, the, the scientific explanation I heard is that when whatever that part of a planet that basically went into the earth's core and expelled the moon uh, dug into the earth. That was that was a point of the point of of insertion. It just uh, seems like a very um, symmetrical, um, you know, s surgical point of insertion for uh, a, pl a planetary uh, event, especially when the the planet wasn't really that hardened yet. I I don't know enough about this stuff, but it's a very possible. That's possible. Yeah, it's, that's it's very, my, my go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> okay, the, so the uh, um the yeah the the latency, it's a it's a skill to deal with. Um the um the recot, it, it's possible that you know however many billion years ago that the uh, the the moon formation was happening, it's possible that the recot is a scar of that impact, and that the recot itself would not have been formed, but a weak point, a weak point in the crust persisted which through periodic and geologists still have no certain idea of how that darn thing was formed, but a weak point in the crust from some type of moon style impact separation thing. Um, yeah, you could get concentric circles. You would have a weak point from the impact. And then the concentric circles come from the repeated lava dome, uh, pyroclastic flow, whatever you call it. And then uh, you can call it settles over time. The difference. Pyroclastic flow. Um, I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so what what what's uh, what what do you think um what do you think about uh to to debunk on on a uh, on a type of building thing or an architecture thing? Uh, what else is on the on your mind for debunking? Well, I, I mean we've got things like Machu Picchu. We have mm. uh, uh, we have Angkor Wat. We I mean there's there's the you know you I don't even know the names of the places there's but you see the beautiful photos of these temples and cities built into the sides of mountains you've got the, mm. the even the simple structures of like the 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 hopi indians in the southwest how they get up there and build that the nazca lines how they get up there and 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 do all that um but much of this might be answered by a simple question so what the big question out there is everyone say how did they get these gigantic rocks and move them you know, move them, period, and get them so orderly and have the, the, the rocks together so tightly and perfectly cut without any power tools and lasers and things like that. 
And maybe, yeah. that's, maybe you know, Occam's razor tells you if everyone did it, maybe it's not as hard as we thought it was to actually do it. You just needed to have, you know, enough people at spear point and enough time. Um, you know, but Occam's razor could also say, oh, yeah, well, gods came down and did it or aliens came down and yeah. did it. That, that's also that's the other side of Occam's razor. So maybe you have an answer for megalithic structures and construction generally. Yeah, I have I have an I have my own speculative answer about the why of um, megalithic stuff, uh, because we could see that as the Bronze Age, the Chalcolithic and then the Bronze and then the Iron Age happened, where you go copper, hardened copper, bronze, brass, iron, the bricks got smaller. And I haven't heard anyone talk or give an explanation as to why, except that old stuff equals amazing and newer stuff is kind of not as great. Or, but, but if you think about how the cutting material works, the when you're in, and, and this is I'm coming from a building and a design perspective on this is that when you the bigger your stones, the less cuts you're making. And I think that's the answer for megaliths right there of the why one of the part of the answer of why. Obviously, I think there's a spiritual part and, and you can even kind of you can feel this today. You can you, in many places, especially a place like like Stonehenge or the Menhirs in France, you can you can get a feeling as to why, and I think this is very important. I think we're rediscovering this, by the way. I should throw out there that I've been shopping around this idea that the I would love to 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 discover and maybe even to to work out to to build there the idea of I think our culture is moving towards the fun thing of a project for a temple of a religion that does not yet exist. Right? I'm that there's saying. there's there's some kind of spiritual understanding that we're moving towards and the, the, the this religions change, there are new religions and the religions that have lasted over civilizational breaks and changes. And there are some of them around today that have been around for a few thousand years and they have the things that are still ancient and still the same things. And there are the things that are very different. And one of the things that are very significantly different is the, uh, is how the religious architecture is done. And I think it's appropriate. The Egyptians, with their miraculous uh, sense of history, would, uh, which the Greeks and Romans did not have, the, the Egyptians would deliberately have some appreciation of this. I think their oral tradition, I have good evidence, by the way, that their oral tradition does go back reliably 30,000 years. I kind of, mm -hmm. I was, I was drafting in, this is still when I was in Lima, and my spare time, like in the evening when I was done with work, I would open up AutoCAD and just for fun, because you can zoom in and out of it, I'd make a historical timeline. And I could zoom way out and get geological timeline, zoom way in and see like Akhenaten and then later on up there, the reign of the Romans and the fall of the Roman Republic. And then I thought, well, what happens when I put the king's lists in there? I put in the various kings list, the Turin kings list and all this. And there was one kings list with, and, there are, and there are various Zeptepis, various first times in Egypt. And the one that goes way back, there's one that goes way back to 30,000 BC. And then my jaw f almost fell off my face. I realized that this kings list, one of the more, the kings list out of Manetho, which I would say is likely to be with his scholarship and his access to the documents in the library of Alexandria, probably the more rigorous kings list. So Manetho's King's List goes back and you could tell the memory fades like it would with oral tradition. He goes into kings and then he goes into dynasties and then he goes into the length of kingdoms. This is rational. If he was totally faking it, he'd probably have individual kings all the way back. He doesn't. So this this is, that's some verisimilitude there. And then the very beginning where he said the Zeptepi became and the, the land of Egypt emerged from the stormy waters, the chaotic waters, that happened exactly with the end of a geological period called the Mousterian Pluvial. And I thought, okay. whoa, okay, it's very likely that the Egyptians were preserving with their oral and maybe their sculptural because Herodotus, again, talks about how the Egyptians, if you read the Herodotus carefully, he talks about, oh, no, no, uh, this is Plato. This is Plato because he's talking about Solon. When Solon went to the temple at Sais, which they they acknowledge that Athena came from Egypt, um, that they preserved the memory of the generations by the statues of priests. 
and they memorialized it that way. And so they were able to get a good idea. And this is probably with these long memories, you can understand how the Egyptians astronomically had a sense of precession of the equinoxes because they were observing stellar things for a long time. Right. You don't need the telescopes. You don't need aliens to do any of that. Again, like you were saying, time will give you those answers, time and consistency. And in Egypt and in the Sahara, which we knew they were, they were in the green Sahara. And then the pharaonic culture came east as it dried up. Uh, what's it called? Nabta Playa shows us this. It's the Egyptian Stonehenge. So they were, uh, yeah, th that Egypt did come out uh, of the stormy waters at that at that time. And so the megaliths, back to the megaliths, that as you go in your technology to a sharper edge that lasts longer, it's easier to make more cuts. Right. So you get smaller bricks, you get bricks of a custom shape and everything. Uh, and the older the technology is, if you're cutting in flint, you can do that. And then um, there's the whole thing about the power tools and everything. Now, my combination of yes and no on that, I think they did have power tools. I made a video of it. They didn't have, I don't think they had electricity. I think they had power tools, but they did not have electricity. But we know how that works because the medieval era had power tools without electricity. It was called a spinning wheel mm -hmm. or, 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 it was, or it was called a jigsaw jenny, that, that you have a foot treel and you have a reciprocating, you have something with an inertial wheel principle. If you, you can get inertial wheels and reciprocation or inertial wheels and rotating, Oh, you are off to the technological races and there's absolutely also, uh water couldn't you do it like a mill yes yes you definitely can do a mill and guess what the egyptians we think the egyptians weren't hydrological engineers we know they were uh johanna james i made my video about a drill about a I, I threw i made a model of one i threw i made a little drill with a piece of flint that i put on it just for fun and i drilled with my colleague brian i drilled a piece of soap we threw it's on my youtube channel we throw a big lump of wax as a weight over our balcony and then the drill spins and it it works so that that happened there's a guy that johanna james met on one of her recent videos an english guy who's an engineer who was also thinking about the jed principle of rotating and inertia and about those jed pillars um and he came up he made really cool models that you see how it works on her video about how if you use um you can make a gear train you can make it like a bicycle gear situation and uh, with you to your question earlier, how did they pull the rocks? Well, the Egyptians didn't have block and tackle like the Romans did that we have evidence of, but we have iconographic evidence of jeds everywhere. And the word jed means enduring power. So doesn't that make you think about inertial wheels? Also, if in that the fact that you could use it as a pulley system yeah, that might have been part of it. Um, there's to get a little bit further out on the speculation that could be real is um, not acoustic levitation necessarily, but acoustic friction reduction. Okay. If you get loud enough sounds, which is possible, um, then uh, on, a, on a low, that, that have low order harmonics, and you get that thing loud enough, which you could conceivably do with lots of people with trumpet style things, this also makes you think about about Jericho and everything and maybe what was happening yeah, there. Yeah, you just read my mind, yeah. Yeah, and and so it's possible that they would have had the track with the rock and you get either the track or the rock to vibrate and if and when you hit the right frequency, you will drastically reduce the the friction. That's amazing. Yeah, well that's, that that is amazing. Uh, so the pyramids not batteries, not no ley lines. Uh, we haven't <laughs> lost the ability to levitate things, but uh, but the sound and resonance. There's something to it in that the the, the with a certain resonance you can. Uh, I, I you're greasing it without grease. Yeah, yeah, or or like turning regular grease into super grease. It's Ooh. yeah. And there, there's a lot of stuff with that. I think that the, and for whatever reason, this is more on the metaphysical side that I think always impacts design and people's motivations in, in fun and important ways with cultural cohesion. Cause you know, heaven knows we could use some cultural cohesion lately, but mm -hmm. the, um, for whatever reason, I don't think it's an accident that there's a revival of interest in, in Egyptian stuff because um, Vasily Kandinsky wrote about this in a book called On the Spiritual and Art. 
And I did a whole thing about it on my podcast years ago. Um, and that I have several episodes covering that. And one of the things he says in there is that there are periods in history where we have a sense of understanding or not understanding something in the past. And then when our culture changes, the kind of past culture that we have a fascination with makes sense that that would also shift. So for whatever reason, and then like what we've, uh, I won't get into the theory on this, but that, that could be for later, but the, uh, that's, that's all Spengler stuff, but the um, Oswald Spengler decline of the West, but the, the, the Greeks and Romans for a long time, for a little bit more than a thousand years have been the constructive opposite of Western thinking, of Western mathematical construction. My speculation now is that whatever mathematics is changing into when it started to change in the late 19th century with the non-Euclidean geometry and then special relativity, and we're thinking differently and our technology lets us think to, that intensifies how we can think differently. So in our, in our artistic sensibilities, we're more fascinated by the Egyptian stuff because before Napoleon and especially before the 1920s, no one really cared so much. That's why all those discoveries were made and all that stuff was there. They could have found King Tut's tomb, but there was money to look for it, desire to look for it in the 1920s, and they found it, and then that just amplifies it. I don't think this is when, – when you get enough, as Boval said, when you get enough pigeons on a table, it stops being a coincidence. Right. There starts being a reason. I think part of the reason for this fascination with ancient stuff in general and the Egyptian stuff specifically is we are reawakening or reconnecting to a spiritually meaningful understanding – about how we feel about how the earth and sky move and how we feel about that and how there are genuine changes to stuff like that. And the, uh, I think that a sense of what, and this is Spengler very briefly, the, the mathematical construction that has governed the West has been X, Y, Z axis and infinite space. And, and even if you haven't heard about that before, you stop and think about it for a minute and it makes sense. And in the uh, in the Eastern kind of um, you know Orthodox Christian rabbinical Judaism and Islam cultures all together back there, he he called that one one way of mathematical thinking, which I think makes sense. And in that way of mathematical thinking, there was like the algebra, there was the sense of the dome of the heavens, the dome of the sacred building, balance, microcosm, microcosm, yeah. And so that's a different. That's that's one reason he says that's why the uh, the Arabs invented algebra, uh, and then the Westerners invented calculus because mm -hmm. it came out of it. That makes sense. Well, I, we're, 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 we've shifted. I think we're far enough along that we're starting to shift into a thing that we don't fully understand yet. But it's interesting to me. Um, I would agree with those theories that all art is born religious. And some of the ideas of, of uh, sacred architecture is a big part of that. And the, uh, for whatever reason, I think the sense of acoustics, sound, reciprocation, I think this is where a lot of spiritual innovation, that used to be a dirty word, spiritual innovation, um, the spiritual innovation and technological innovation can come from. Yeah. I mean, sound is energy. There's, there's mm -hmm. no denying that. Sound has matter, sound has force. So, I mean, that anyone who's ever lived uh, near where the Concorde used to fly <laughs> remembers yeah. it. I did. I <laughs> wow. right on the approach. So, uh, and and the, the both both e egress and ingress. Uh, mm -hmm. Back when there was both British Airways and Air France running the the Concorde, yeah, that was that was all Kennedy Airport, and I, I was right there in the uh, right there in the mm -hmm. flight zone. Anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there was just a sonic boom in D.C. when they scrambled a, a F-22 or something uh, mm -hmm. because of a non-authorized. And there was a sonic boom that, that terrified people. I mean, sound has force. So, you know, if somebody used that to harness and if that's what they were able to do, uh, that would be a technology that, that you know, the theory of divergence is that, you know, the, these things sort of spread uh, one way or another through trade, commerce, uh, whatever it is. Um, but. Yeah, it is really fascinating. I, you know, I don't want to list particular places because I, I think it's it'll, it'll drive mad. I think that the concepts that you espouse were probably apply in in some way, shape, or form to all of them. Um, but if there's anything in particular that you want to debunk, uh, I think this is a free mm. debunk zone. 
Yeah, what drives me nuts that should be debunked? That's a fun question. I would... We've and covered several to... of them already. Um, there's the... There's Santorini. Uh, there's... Okay, well, there's the Dendera light bulb. <laughs> Let's do... Other people have covered this really well. It's not like I'm giving any new news. Uh, but yeah, the Dend... Oh, man, the Dendera light bulb. So uh, for any... Oh, yeah. Okay, these are related. There's the Dendera light bulb, and this might be at Dendera and it might not be, but there's the, the there's the spaceship hieroglyphs. That yeah. it, it looks like Luke Skywalker's uh, hover speeder. Right, right, right. It, it actually does. Um, but the... <laughs> I can't debunk that Akhenaten looks like Obama because that's a fact. He does look like Obama, but okay. I have no theory about that. But anyways, um, the yeah, those two things, the Dendera light bulb. The and the alien. Sometimes people resemble yeah. each other. That's right. <laughs> there we go. I, I mean, uh, I look like Kevin James. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, uh, the hieroglyphs. Um, and again, this is the thing, what frustrates me about this is that the fake awesome distracts from the real awesome mm -hmm, it does. and fake awesome might be good for fiction, but you know, I, I'm so much more of a fan of real awesome. That's why I get frustrated by things like the HBO Rome, which was good, mm -hmm. but if they had stuck Wasn't. to the plot, if they had stuck to the Plutarch, oh, it could have been great, you know? Anyways, season so the one was good. It's, yeah. <laughs> and season two lost the thread and season three was really bad. They they had money problems, you know, there was budgets uh, to, to apologize for it a little bit. But yeah, I agree with you mostly. But the, um, so those hieroglyphs in the Dendera light bulb, um, NEXT um, on YouTube and also Uncharted X, um, both of those guys have good, but NEXT especially because he talks about uh, John Anthony West's scholarship on it from what I think is really great in what they call the Symbolist School of Egypt out of the scholarship of uh, um, uh, Schvaller de Lubitsch, J. Schvaller de Lubitsch. Uh, it's uh, the Dendera light bulb. I'll get back to the hieroglyphs. The Dendera light bulb is not really a light bulb and this video is great because they actually what a lot of the speculators do is they do not read the texts there's texts all over that stuff and they can't read it but i can't read it either but i i like looking up the people who do and then you can mm -hmm. find out and it's 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 talking about the birth of a king it's a very egyptian thing to do to talk about the birth of a king and then also to reference as like an echo a meaningful metaphorical echo or beyond metaphor. It's like an analogy, I guess, uh, like the birth of the universe, mm. birth of the king, birth of the universe. Our king is such a powerful king that he preserves order in the universe. That's how they thought. And so it's it's about honoring that. And it's it's about uh, divine creative power. Uh, the, the sense of the serpents, it's not a light bulb filament. It's, it's, it's a sense, it is a sense of, of power, but it, it, all, it probably has, this is my own speculation, but I think it's, there's something to it. It has to do with like the, uh, a serpent would be the, like to echo Jordan Peterson here, the serpent of chaos, Apep, the primordial serpent. And here the primordial serpent is kind of straightened out. It's still wavy, but it's straightened out. So you have the, the kind of void creation going, coming out of the body of the king. I'll, I'll leave it at that for family friendly. It's coming out. They, they don't talk about it because it's embarrassing. It's coming out mm -hmm. of the body of the king. The Egyptians did that on purpose because the king is having sons. Old, it'd be a very old picture of you and I, a very old picture. <laughs> so so that's, yeah, there, there are all these it, kinds it, of interesting. The, uh, it's not the elemental wind symbolism. The, the elemental wind? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes the I don't symbol know. like it could be a, about you know, that one. elemental wind, you know, the four elements, oh, the like, symbology. like earth, wire, earth, fire, and water and wind. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ah, well, that might be, uh, the speculation, um, part of the speculate, uh, I think that maybe fits with some of the symbolist interpretation because it's more meta than semen, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it may be less accurate though. Uh, you know, but it might uh, be. But, so we've seen, you know, the the lines, the wave, and yes, you've got the, yep. the, the primordial snake, but you also have this, the snake often goes with water, but when that's shaped, there's the wind, and then you've got two elements coming, and, you know, what, what else does a, a creator of a, of a universe and a world do but, you know, uh, make the elements? 
Yeah, and the lotus, I think you have all the elements present. That's a very interesting observation. The lotus is coming out of the earth. So you thought I was water. your dumb friend here, and I sort of am here, by the way. Oh, no, 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 no. Free, freely admitting. Um, but, uh, yeah, but every now and then from the mouths of babes, I, I, I have a – something comes out that, that makes the show worth it to the guest. Oh, no, it's no, – no, the whole thing is great. No, really. Um, it's the um, – Yes, the Dendera light bulb is way more complex and fascinating than technological light bulbs. The the hieroglyphs that look like, they genuinely look like a helicopter or a tank or a Star Wars speeder. But Ooh. that was the, that's a palimpsest, what they call a palimpsest, an overlaying of two sets of text. It's it's hieroglyphs where uh, something to do generationally with one of the Ramses is that they would, uh, they were carving over, they were carving over and then doing infill to say their, the names, the names of the kings. And then eventually the infill fell out uh, and and you get this thing that looks like, like the thing that was the speeder. And for mm -hmm. people who aren't on YouTube, they thought my, my hand makes a good, well, it's a hand hieroglyph. And right. then stuff falls out. And then what is a hand hieroglyph looks weirdly technological. But that's, yeah, that's, that's, I get bent out of shape about that sometimes, <laughs> that people right. take that. Well, there's, there's a lot of those sort of famous, uh, you know, uh, carvings, boss reliefs, whatever. There's, there's the one that looks like a dinosaur, like a brontosaurus in Anger Wat. There's, um, yeah. there's, there's, you know, there's similar symbology in Mesoamerican temples and pyramids as there are in Babylonian, Sumerian temples. That, you know, you have birds and similar poses and things like that. And I think those are all remarkable. And there's things that look like they could be spacesuits or deep sea suits or, uh, but also there are folks carving into rock and those just might be easier shapes to do. And it might just be, uh, you know, somebody with a helmet on their head, uh, you know, a war helmet or a ceremonial helmet. I, I love all the fun stuff too, but I, I don't find that there's carvings to be, all that remarkable, uh, even if they look very similar, because we all did come from some place at one point, and some of those stories and symbologies of the peoples, whatever whatever they were, Homo erectus or what, or Homo sapien, what, whoever they were, the, you know, those got carried as people moved, and and they got changed. So some place. The fish became more important than than the bird. Someplace the bear became more important than the than the tiger, or, or you know, or whatever the case might be. Um, but are are there any things like 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 does that dinosaur in in Asia drive you mad? Uh the the Asian dinosaur, that's never bothered me so much what is something that looks is is this one the one that looks like a stegosaurus or is the one that looks like the stegosaurus in um in bolivia i think that one must be in bolivia this one just more looks like almost like a toy brontosaurus like when when ah when i was a kid and you got the little plastic ones that look more like dopey from land of the lost than you know uh jurassic park right yeah these days they have their tails stick carry high and stick out because they got new osteology or something i'm not familiar with i don't know about that one in um that sounds like a really interesting one i don't know about that one um there's the the stegosaurus one that i am familiar with that does kind of bother me that that it looks like a uh because uh, again there's interesting stuff there and what is what is that place uh tiwanaku i believe it's called yeah. tiwanaku and puma punku that the that the the guy who's probably from Greece. Everyone knows him as the aliens guy. I, I don't want to. Uh, Gior Giorgio Sukolos, I believe his name is, but he's he's famous for a picture where he's like aliens. Oh right. Uh, so but he's that that guy. Um, in yeah. one of the early. I'm not saying it was aliens, the, but it was aliens. Yeah. <laughs> in 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 one of the early ancient aliens uh, documentaries, which I think was part of popularizing this whole uh, stuff that could be debunked trend. Um, that he would I, I wish i could find this because this is such a great clip from him where he almost sounds exactly like dr nick from the simpsons and he's saying he's, he's saying in puma punku logic does not exist 
And I was like, oh, oh okay. But there's the, all, all the things from those episodes, like Ancient Aliens entertains me and upsets me at the same time, which I think the producers were trying to go for that to increase ratings. And well, I'm a sucker for it. And like the, the stuff, the stuff about like the little pins that are supposed to be airplanes. Oh, that drives me nuts. Yeah, maybe they fly. They're flying fish. They come out of the, they're, 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 or, or they're moths. You know, they're, they're, they're clearly, you know, um, it, it's kind of a discredit to that cool culture in Bolivia that made those, those little, you could tell they're little jewelry pieces that people wear. Um, and then in, in Puma Punku or Tiwanaka, whatever it is, this is another Graham Hancock speculation that there might be ancient animals on there that either this is old enough that that's a pre ice age carving or there were people who remembered, oh yeah, way back when, back in the land of the second sun, we are now in the fourth sun, and back in the land of the second sun, oh, our ancestors, there were, and there are stories. This is the thing that people should do instead of making ancient aliens about this stuff, like actually talk to Native American people and figure out, and, and listen and say, well, well what, do, what do your traditions actually say? And then there's really amazing stuff, because Randall Carlson talks about in one of his things that... Uh, in either Georgia or South Carolina, that they had been looking at the Car Carolina Bay impacts, uh, which are fascinating. Um, and uh, there's a guy, uh, I forget his, I can't remember his name at the moment, but if you look up Carolina Bays on YouTube, this guy's stuff will come up. He's, he's done really great at scale uh, experiments with taking ice cubes into mud and doing conic section analysis, really great. But um, Randall Carlson looked at uh, was looking at Carolina bays and there was a lake. There was a lake in, in one of these, like a lake all by itself, a really elliptical type lake probably. And they, uh, they said he, he was, there was someone, I don't think him who was studying about this, wondering if it was a meteor impact, perhaps related to the last ice age. And, uh, so he went there and then someone thought, well, are there any, he, someone who was, whoever was researching this asked, are there any Native American tribes that are, that are still here? And said, oh yeah, uh, the such and such place. And you know, oh, you can go there and they got a small museum or something. Oh, fantastic. The researcher goes there and he says, well, hi, I'm, in, I'm researching this and I'm just around here. And I'm, oh, great. Thanks for visiting the museum. And he says, well, do you guys have any stories? What are your traditional stories about your origins? I said, well, um, our people believe that, that we've, that we've always been here, that we've come from here and that, um, it was either that or they migrated a long time ago, uh, which I guess would be true of any case. But they, but he said that that the name of this place is called the that that long ago when we first found this place, we found this place because a star fell from the heavens and made the lake. And, and we call our our the name of our people means the people the people or the place of the falling star, and their tribal flag is a shooting star and the lake. Right. So it's like it's. It's there. The stuff. Right. The stuff. There's so much great stuff to be discovered that to speculate about dinosaurs in Bolivia is just. Oh yeah, the 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 truth is cool enough, um, and it might be harder to find um, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh, I you know I I think there's a lot to what you were talking about a new kind of religion that we haven't named yet, which is probably yeah. some combination of new and old. Um, and that's probably the subject of another show. I, you know, and there's lots of reasons for it. I think that there's a lot of people who have not found what they want in in traditional religions. And atheism and ag agnosticism are not particularly satisfying uh, when you see so many people who at least look happier when they're more spiritual. And then also there's the bad rap that ultra-religious people often get from the loudest voices that you see in the media uh rarely encounter in real life but every now and then do and so you know there's tons of there's there's always a confluence of of events but um i don't know people ask me what are you and i at this point i say well i'm sort of a dualistic animist and they're like what is that i'm like i'm not exactly sure but i'm trying to figure it out but it, it's I think oh. it's a lot closer to, to what what uh, uh, I think it's a lot closer to what a shaman would believe than a priest. That's that is amazing. I, that that is actually a really articulate statement of a very interesting religious belief that I've never heard of. And I'll ask a follow up question. So do you, do you, do you then believe that there are stones with beneficent energy and stones with maleficent energy? That seems it, like something that 
a dualist animist might believe, but I don't know if you believe it or not. I don't know. And that's okay. I don't know. This is very much a work in progress. Um, this good. whole show, in it's in some ways, is my journey. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't always go in a straight path, which Garden of Doom was an accidental name, but the metaphor uh, of at least being a garden with, a, you know, I in my head, I see swampy, big, giant roots going in all directions and interweaving, like the tree of life and that giant, uh, that, that one tree in Utah that's like 250 miles long, if it has one root, that, that, that sort of thing. Anyway, wow. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm not sure if I buy yet into rocks, though, having having it. I'm not sure I'm that animist, uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not willing to reject it either, you know. Uh, so, uh, I, I am agnostic on that. I don't. I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not far enough in that. Maybe when I get a geologist who's as spiritual and as knowledgeable about history as you are, then then I'll have something to to think ponder on right there. But never did I dream I'd get an architect who would be able to be talking to me about, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson and Solon and uh, you know and, and uh, Herodotus and all all these things. So this is this is you know beyond my wildest dreams. Um, and where have you been all my life? Uh, so <laughs> um, we've gone 75 minutes. That's probably yeah. pretty long for your audience. That's about typical for mine. I want to be respectful of your time. How long does your show normally go? Uh, I would say it usually goes between 45 and in 45 and an hour and 20. I think this is a perfect uh, perfect time. And yeah, thank you. This has been a tremendously grand discussion, and I'm, I'm going to look forward to uh, uh, uploading this. I'm going to blast it out to the communication channels. And uh, what you mentioned about further discussion about uh, spiritual directions and how they manifest in what's built, if you want to do a part two, I think that might be fun. I would love to do a part two. You are welcome back in the Garden of Doom anytime, and we can do Thank it you. as a share cast or, or whatnot. And if you ever invite me on to your shows, I am not intellectually greedy about whose show is what or anything like that, because this really is a journey, and I've given up on becoming the next Joe Rogan a long time ago. Um, <laughs> so this is this has been great. Love to. I you know will definitely be in touch about that, um, but. Anytime, I, I will try to do the best I can to make it happen. And we're both East Coast, so it, 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 that, that's working for us. Ah, all right. Well, yes, very good. So I, uh, well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, be sure everyone to uh, check out uh, Jeff Lippman's uh, show. And maybe, maybe you can tell the folks who are listening on my end, uh, where should they find you? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Garden of Doom is the feed. You can find it anywhere you can find podcasts, uh, Apple, Spotify, Spreaker, Podbean, you name probably a bunch of others as well. You can also find it on the PWC and on the Wrestling Soup Network, believe it or not, and on the Hameen Media Group if you want to join any of those platforms. Some are free, some aren't. Um, and I do a whole bunch of other podcast in my other world, uh, which is pro wrestling. Some of you are laughing at me right now, and you should. You have every right to. But I've been watching it since I'm like five years old, so I'm going on five decades, and I'm not about to quit anytime soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you can you can find my shows there. And uh, on Twitter, I'm at IcarusFellMD. Uh, and if you can deal with a lot of wrestling chatter, uh, there's also some things that are interesting and I love to interact and I really appreciate being on your show and I really appreciate you being on my show. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, by the way, anyone uh, listening, uh, please like, share, subscribe, and check out uh, Jeff's show and uh, pop him a review about the the fun thing that he's doing that helps uh, helps everybody uh, get going with that. And uh, with me, uh, it's uh, YouTube Living Process Getzen, G-E-T-Z-I-N. That should pop it up. And um, if you come straight to me on Twitter, at Histovarch, at H-I-S-T-O-F-A-R-C-H. All my relevant links are in my bio description. And to find out about architecture stuff, livingprocess.net. So, yeah, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, to uh, continuing. Likewise. All right, everyone. Thanks. You, he, he gave the outro about as good as anyone possibly could. So, uh whatever you're doing for me do for his show as well 
uh, like, share, subscribe, review, et cetera, and mostly tell your friends because there's nothing more important. There's 2 million podcasts out there. And I Googled that once, how many podcasts out there? And they said there's 2 million podcasts of, at any time, and that might be conservative. So reviews really do help. Thank you so much for being in the Garden of Doom. And thank you so much for being on Living Process as well. I stole your line for you, uh, but someone's got to close this. So I figure... Uh, I might as well do that since you did do all the hard work, including whatever that word was on on lava levels. Uh, Polly, <laughs> Polly, what was it? Uh, pyroclastic flow, I believe it was. Pyroclastic flow. My God, that's a word. I need to figure out how to use that in a sentence. So everyone, your homework assignment is figure out how to use that in a sentence. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day or night, wherever you are, whenever you are. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're, we're